Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for our follow-up webinar on big data. I'm your host today, Karen Kurtzweil, and I welcome you to contact me or Janet after the webinar to request additional information on our white papers, future webinars, software, and services. Today's, today's uh, webinar will be recorded and available for you on our YouTube channel following uh, this webinar today. Our presenter is Janet Dorncott. Most of you participated in our earlier webinar on big data and already know Janet, but for those of you who do not, Janet has over 20 years of experience in information technology and is co-owner of Relational Solutions along with Rob York. They started Relational Solutions back in 1996 and have specialized in data warehousing and business intelligence since their inception. The complex issues associated with integrating point of sale and syndicated data led them to their focus on the consumer goods industry, where they have developed applications including POS Smart and Blue Sky, designed for handling data complexities that are unique to CPG companies. If you didn't see our earlier presentation on what big data is and why it's huge for CPG, you can find that by going to YouTube and searching Relational Solutions, and you'll find it there on our homepage. With that, I'll turn it over to Janet to talk to you about how to handle big data. Janet, thank you for joining us today. Hi, Karen. Thank you for the introduction. Um, in our last webinar, our goals were to define big data and help you understand what big data is and the evolution of big data. And like Karen said, that's available on our YouTube channel. Um, today we want to explain how to use big data. We'll show you how we extract it and explain how it can be integrated with internal data to provide more business value. Uh, we will explain our recommendations for managing big data and things you will want to consider when trying to leverage it across the enterprise. And lastly, we'll show examples through our business intelligence tool called Blue Sky of what big data can look like when it's used to understand your business better. With that, I'm going to kick this off with a little company background so you know who Relational Sol Solutions is and what qualifies us as experts in this space. So this might be a bit of a repeat for those of you who were on the last webinar, but we've got a lot of new attendees. And as Karen mentioned, Relational Solutions was started back in 1996 as a data warehouse and business intelligence consulting company. And that's very true. Since then, we've been involved in over 200 data warehouse and business intelligence projects. Today, we focus mainly on the consumer goods industry. However, some of our software, including our data integration engine and business intelligence tools, can be used across all industries. Relational Solutions was the first consulting company in the country to use data integration engines to integrate data instead of writing code. Uh, we were actually Informatica's first partner in the country, and we were also Data Stage's first partner as well. Uh, we were, in fact, even part of the Data Stage development team back in 1997. We also did both of those companies' first implementations. Uh, we did Informatica's first implementation at Altel Information Services, and we did Data Stage's uh, first implementation, I believe that was actually at Detroit Medical Center, um, but we did both of those companies. The nature of data warehousing is that it's constantly changing and growing to accommodate business users' needs, as well as changes to the environment, such as new applications, mergers, new data sources, et cetera. And by implementing a foundational architecture that accommodates those changes, Companies are able to accommodate new data, including big data. So even those of our customers today that, are, um, that have our foundation in place are actually able to leverage that data to integrate big data and use that as well. So our applications really provide companies with the foundation that allows them to accommodate new changes and new data sources. And our applications also leverage the power of other technologies. Um, technologies like Teradata, SAP, Oracle, IBM, Microsoft, <clears throat> actually, our partnerships are a very solid testament to our experience in this space. IBM actually resells our foundation with their SAR, within their Smarter Commerce solution. Uh, InfoSys resells and embeds our application in their solution that integrates POS and emerging market data. And we directly support the integration of SAP and are working with them to support DSIM as well. We have a lot of implementations also on Oracle and Microsoft. So again, we are very database independent. Uh, we're also a uh, business intelligence tool independent, so we allow users to implement and leverage whatever other BI tools they have as well. So with that, I'll start with a couple slides that summarize big data um, and jump into how we handle it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the big data explosion 
started with data from applications designed to run your business. Those would be applications that are ERP or enterprise resource planning applications. And they really took off in the 80s and 90s. Companies like SAP, Oracle, Microsoft, SAS, uh, JDE, these are all companies that offer ERP solutions. <clears throat> Excuse me. And these applications are designed to run your business. They include applications for things like manufacturing and logistics and accounting, order entry, and so forth. ERP applications also have reports associated with them, but they are reports that are related to their specific application in most cases. So in the early 90s, companies started getting serious about using that data to improve knowledge. So business processes um, were, were leveraged within these ERP applications, but when you wanted to integrate or when you needed to look at that data versus other information and not just do reports coming straight out of Siebel or reports coming out of J.D. Edwards, for example, that data then needed to be leveraged and integrated to understand, um, you know, to improve their knowledge and then to improve profits and productivity and improve their own internal business processes as well. And so back in the 90s, data warehousing was really in its infancy, but there were a lot of failures back then, and companies would spend tons of money to build data warehouses, and they would still end up with inconsistent reports and end-user issues with creating reports and so forth. That's actually the reason we started Relational Solutions, because it seemed as though every consulting company on the market was um, focused on Y2K compliance, but we really um, focused specifically on data warehouse architectures and business intelligence and we established a reputation as gurus really in this space and became the go-to company when, when it came to data warehousing and data integration and business intelligence. So next we saw the beginnings of cooperation between partners, and we really felt like missionaries in the consumer goods space back in the day trying to explain the value of sharing point-of-sale data. Uh, retailers in the 90s really thought we were crazy when we asked them to share POS data with the vendors, but today most of them understand the value of sharing that data. And more and more outside partners and new vendors began offering new data and insights as well. And we were able to see, um, see that data and leverage that data and develop a solution that would integrate those data sources within the company's existing data warehouse architecture. And that's where our POS smart infrastructure came about, and we've been integrating outside sources since the 90s. Some of those sources include point-of-sale data and EDI feeds and syndicated data feeds from companies like IRI and Nielsen and NPD. Uh, we see a lot of consumer goods companies buying panel data and demographic data. Most companies are getting some sort of currency conversion information if they're an international, if they sell internationally. Um, but that's, you know, even there are some sources here that are not even necessarily listed, um, you know, that aren't even necessarily provided for on a regular basis. Things like loyalty data, for example. So. Another source that companies are starting to want to share information with are their wholesalers, distributors, brokers, and other selling partners. It's really interesting to see the market evolve. Most companies really didn't understand what we were preaching about all those years ago when we talked about having a foundation in place that would accommodate change. And in most cases, all they cared about were the reports. But today that's changing. And as the market evolves, companies and people are maturing in their understanding of how important it is to have that big data infrastructure. Even reporting companies who used to consider us competitors are starting to understand the differences in what we do versus what they're developing. And lastly here in this last circle um, is the latest evolution of big data. Combined, it's all big data, but in the pure sense of how software companies refer to big data today, they're mainly talking about the data coming in from the web. And this includes social media chatter that comes from Facebook, Google Plus, and Twitter. It also includes comments, announcements, and posts from professional networking sites like LinkedIn. These are the comments or the common areas that people think of when it comes to big data. Um, but there are also many other areas, any areas that are listed above. If you think about things like um, speech to text, that you're translating everything that's said into searchable text, for example, that is big data. Video content and the associated metadata posted on sites like YouTube is all big data. Think about all the photos posted on Instagram and Facebook and even profile pictures on LinkedIn. That's all part of big data. Uh, another, thing to area, another area to think about is um, geospatial information or location information. That's data used by companies to do things like track shipments and identify missing cars and monitor storms and send the truckers to the right location where they may be out of stock and so forth. So those are also areas with big data. 
um, blogs. People, you know, I recently talked to someone who said, oh, nobody's really using this Internet stuff. Well, I reminded that person that they blog all the time about their different sports teams and so forth. That is big data. Um, to a company like ESPN, that is, data is important. To an NFL team or a um, baseball team, understanding what people are saying about those teams, that's important. So comments on blogs are tracked by companies to determine what's being said about them. These are uh, tracked to keep tabs not only on your competitors and their new announcements or to identify comments being made about your company and your products and services and so forth. Um, engineers, that's another good example. They share schematics and blueprints and other examples of big data. Um, clicks on the web, those are also examples of big data. We actually did what we think is the first clickstream analysis project back in 1997, and that was for a telecom company who wanted to track where their companies were going on their website. So today, clickstream analysis is used by just about every company, and it's used to do target marketing. And I have a basic example that I can show you or that I'll be showing you in the demo. So why is big data associated with these items in the last circle, and what's the difference in the data? Uh, why do I have these circles around the different data types, and what determines where each of these items reside? Well, it's really based on the way that the data is structured. So this slide pretty much explains the differences. In the first cylinder here, uh, this represents the first two circles from the page before, and that's because this data is structured. However, they are structured differently, uh, which is why I had them sep in two separate circles on the previous slide. That said, they are still structured, and as I mentioned before, ERP data is structured in a way that allows for data entry. The data warehouse is structured for information retrieval. The data that is outside and on the web is mostly unstructured. Social media information includes things like tweets and comments, but it also includes your activities such as who you like, who you follow, who follows you, who likes you, and, and so forth. It can track your social authority or clout by determining how many followers you have and who you follow, and depending on the number of people you have, the frequency of comments, the number of likes and clicks you get are some things that are used to determine your authority or clout or your reposts. Those are all things determined that determine your clout. Someone with 100 followers, for example, does not have the same degree of clout as someone with 3,000 followers. And I have an example of this that I can show you on the demo, but someone with 100 followers that has, you know, that posts 100 times a day might very well have as much clout as someone with 3,000 followers that never does or posts anything. So it depends on multiple factors. But big data has, um, has been in the news a lot lately. Last month we heard about America's National Security Agency, the NSA, obtaining the um, all Verizon customers' calling history. We also learned about the IRS targeting certain conservative nonprofits, and we learned that our government was monitoring certain journalist calls and computer activity. These things all require them to leverage big data, which is why it's been, why we hear about big data so much in the news today. So a lot of people don't think, oh, those, that technology exists, but it does. Uh, government uses big data to track terrorists and secure our country and, unfortunately, to play politics. Hospitals use it to monitor patients and protect themselves from lawsuits. Other industries leverage big data for target marketing, reputation management, and so forth. So leveraging that social media is very important, and companies that aren't doing it yet today are going to find themselves behind the eight ball if they don't jump on board pretty soon. The last cylinder here represents multi-structured data or hybrid data. A lot of data sources can fall into this space. For the purpose of the consumer goods manufacturer, I use the common outside data sources that we see most often. For example, point of sale data itself um, is very unstructured in many ways. I shouldn't say unstructured, but very much of a multi-structured data source. Um, for example, point of sale that comes from Target could come in an EDI file. That EDI file is structured. However, although it's supposed to be standardized, it's not. Different retailers provide different data. Data can be missing or invalid or duplicated. The data also needs to then be aligned with other third-party data that might come in from a target website, such as Partners Online or Info Retriever. And then maybe they're also buying third-party data from Nielsen or IRI. It also needs to align with your internal hierarchy calendars. And these are just a few examples of data issues that arise from outside data sources so in other words, some of these sources, or some, there is some structure to it, but the structure needs to be altered in order to be managed and integrated into other sources and ultimately provide more examples um, or more value. The example I gave with just the target data, 
That's just one retailer because Target can come in the EDI format, Partners Online, Info Retriever, Nielsen, iRide. There's just so many ways that you can get just that one retailer, and the other retailers are really no different. So I point that out because, again, that's not truly unstructured, but it's also, you know, not necessarily structured in a way that's very usable either. So for this reason, we define big data as not only volume, variety, and velocity, but also we add complexity. And these, really, I took these slides basically from the other presentation and just kind of summarized a few things just to level set so we all have a clear understanding of what big data is before we explain how to use it. So with volume, variety, velocity, and complexity, data volumes today are incredible. And if you think about a consumer goods company with maybe 2,000 SKUs that are selling at 100 different retailers, there could be hundreds of thousands of outlets that they're actually selling through. And every day, each store could be sending that CPG company data, data that includes um, what's sold, how many items were sold, the time, the date of the sale, inventory information, uh, potentially price, loyalty, market basket information, all these things. We're talking massive outside data volume, not to mention the CPG company's internal data, data that's coming from um, their own Facebook page or YouTube channel or LinkedIn page or Twitter feeds and all about their company brand. These, again, these are huge data volumes. Um, so volume is one thing, but big data is also about variety. Uh, CPG companies are ob obviously no stranger to variety in addition to their own internal variety. Their internal variety alone typically consists of things like Access and Excel and Oracle and mainframes and SAP and DB2. Um, those are pretty common internal data sources that we see. But you also have applications that reside, you know, that are internal that may, re may re reside on a specific um, database, but it's designed for a specific purpose, like trade promotion management applications, or planograms, or CRM applications, forecasting. Um, there's just a slew of them. Everybody is familiar with all those internal applications and how many of them there are. But you have a lot of variety also coming from the retailers. And I gave the one example just in the previous slide of target data alone could come in so many formats. Walmart can come in EDI files, AS2 files, retail link, or from any of those other providers that I mentioned earlier, the syndicated data providers. Most companies are also buying demographic information, surveys, weather trends, currency conversion information, and they might even be trying to track their emerging market sales if they're an international company at this point. Um, but again, these you, you also have data related to tracking your social reputation and media presence. You have space information, display information, diagrams, Marketing teams, for instance, have ads, including print and online ads, TV commercials, and radio spots. It's just endless, the number of different data sources there are, and that adds up to a lot of variety. Big data is also about timing. So it's not just about volume and variety, it's about velocity. ERP data is updated every second of the day by multiple users across the company in most cases. POS data can come in daily, weekly, monthly, depending on the retailer and the data source. Pricing information and zip code information might be something you might add periodically, or if there's, you know, zip code rarely changes more than quarterly or annually. We'll see companies get uh, different zip codes or demographic market areas. Clickstream analysis, on the other hand, is happening constantly. Twitter feeds happen sporadically throughout the day, so for smaller companies, it might only happen a couple times a month. Um, other larger companies, you may have dozens a minute or even hundreds a minute. However frequently your social media comments happen, you still need to make sure that you're um, monitoring and managing those comments. So a lot of companies that we hear talk about big data define it as volume, variety, and velocity. But I add one more key component, and that is data complexity. Because making big data work involves complexity. And I've heard people that say they think variety covers complexity, but it really doesn't. The variety is just all the different data sources. When data needs to be put into a usable format, there are many alignments and rules that need to be applied, and those rules are involve writing the rules and code and processes that need to be written to extract or integrate or apply business rules um, to load the data, clean the data, refine it. All the, data, all the variety of data that needs to be transformed into a common data type for analysis is also required. So there's 
metadata, which is data about the data, and that needs to be managed. Just the process alone of trying to align data and put it into a usable format becomes new data. So volume, variety, and velocity focus strictly on the source, but data that makes the data usable with internal data is also new data. And that new data needs to be structured, documented, maintained, and managed. Um, so therefore, complexity definitely adds to big data. Aligning hierarchies and integrating master data with retail master data, comparing sales with sentiment, as well as things like promotions and pricing. These are just a few examples of the complexity involved in getting more value out of big data. So again, to me, volume, variety, velocity, along with complexity, makes up what big data is. So this slide I just included again because I thought it was pretty cool. Um, this is just a few of the statistics, the most recent statistics I was able to find. It's pretty difficult to find more recent statistics, but I think it's a good solid proof that companies need to be leveraging big data. Um, these are the most recent statistics I could find, and the source includes Twitter, Pew Research, and McKinsey and Google themselves. So as of last year, Twitter had over 100 million active users. That's projected to reach 200 million this year. 50 million Twitter users log on every day, and over half of those are mobile users. Today there are over 300 million tweets per second, and that's growing exponentially. The record number of tweets on a single topic were related to Stephen Jobs, when he passed away, and that was 2.5 million tweets in the first 13 hours after his death. People spend 700 trillion minutes on Facebook each month. That's in a single month. Google records 34,000 searches per second. The data explosion is really still in its infancy. With the evolution of smartphones, mobile data is exploding. These numbers are just growing every day. So for all we know, this, this could be double from where I, I was able to pull this recent information. But uh, what we do know is that, that it's growing constantly and that we have to be able to uh, leverage that. So what do we do with big data? How do we handle it? And how do we use it? And that's what we're going to talk about next. I'm going to show you a couple examples of big data extracts and then show you how it looks in our tool for analysis. First, leveraging big data means you have to be able to access it. So there's a lot of software applications that allow you to do this. Um, it's important to know who your followers are. Basic information you should know is how many followers you get, um, you know, how do you work on increasing those. You should also know how many, custom, or how many comments and posts you get. You should also have some general knowledge of the demographics. You need to engage with your followers and make sure you're managing your social reputation. So um, the foundation of our application that we talk about is really what's most important here. There are all sorts of different sources like we talked about. Over here we've got examples of different retailers. We've got examples of different um, social media sites. We've got our examples of ERP applications and even third-party data providers. And again, this is just a small sampling. This is what we would see in any, any one of our typical customers. What we're doing is on a nightly basis, our Blue Sky Integration Studio is looking for new data that arrives it's taking that data, it's staging it into an area where we're then cross-referencing it and applying master data and applying all the rules and so forth that we need to, and then we're loading that into a database that's designed for easy reporting. So end users can access and query that database, but also we're automating the generation of any reports that are scheduled to run because those reports are then scheduled and cached on the server so the end users are ready to access them, they're available and ready for them, it's there at their fingertips. Um, the POS Smart infrastructure or the foundation itself also allows us then to add other subject areas. So this isn't a build it all at once sort of a thing. This is a foundational architecture that grows with your business. And initially what might be most important is for you to say, hey, I want to see my top five retailers and I want to see how, um, how our social sentiment relates to the stores on a city by city level, for instance. The application allows that foundation to integrate the data necessary to meet the next hottest business requirement that your company has. So underneath this first pink bar, that's the underlying infrastructure that exists that allows you to manage the application and grow the business. On the front end, you're going to see our Blue Sky tool, and that's going to show you how the data looks. Um, but we also allow other business intelligence tools to access and query the database itself. 
along those lines, that's where I mentioned that the database is a very open architecture. So you can actually implement this on any, virtually any database technology, on Teradata, on SQL Server, on DB2, Oracle, um, NetEase, you name it, we, we support it. And the Blue Sky Business Intelligence Tool is a very powerful application, but we also recognize that a lot of companies have BI tools already in place, and we want you to be able to leverage those for your benefit, too. So the underlying architecture consists of our Blue Sky Integration Studio. In our Blue Sky Integration Studio, you'll hear me refer to it as Biz. This is where all of those processes are designed to actually apply business rules and clean the data, and it's also mapped. This is where we're mapping the different data sources, and then we're transforming that data. And by transforming, what I mean is that, again, data that comes, if you want to put this on a Teradata platform, or say an Oracle platform or DB2 or, what, or NetEase or whatever it might happen to be. In our data center, we do have a, a very powerful MPP platform. However, you can put it on whatever platform you want if you want it behind your firewall. Regardless, if that data comes in an EDI file, it needs, needs to be transformed into Teradata, for example. You might also be getting SQL Server files. That needs to be transformed into Teradata. Oracle files need to be transformed flat files, CSV files, Excel files, that all needs to be transformed. Within our integration studio called Biz, that's where we're doing that transformation. This is the hard part of any of the projects, but this is the part that we have nailed because we've been doing this for so long. So with that, I'm going to show you the examples of um, the uh, reports and the data. First, I'm going to show you what the raw data feeds look like. Then I'm going to show you our tool that uh, is used to clean it without getting in too much detail because I know most of the people on the call, we've got some IT folks, but we also have a lot of business users, so I don't want to get too deep into the, um, into the weeds on the IT side because any company who's interested in seeing more detail, please give us a call and we'll be happy to um, tailor the demonstration specific to your business requirements. But I've got a couple of files here. This is an example of a social media extract that includes um, chatter. So I've got a file that shows chatter. I've also got another one that's going to show you some clickstream data. It's actually our own uh, clickstream data that you may even recognize some of the uh, information on. But this is social chatter. This is data that was taken from Twitter. We've got the host name, the date, the date detail, the authority of that host, the authority level, the number of followers, who they're following. It's just a flat file that shows you basically standard information. We've also got in this file um, some snippets. We've got the um, detail of what, what those individuals are saying. Obviously, this is very dummied up information. I couldn't use actual data, um, so we've, we've put in some fake uh, beverage names in here. And I'm going to show you what that looks like in our application. That is the example I have for social chatter. And then I've got an example here based on uh, clickstream analysis. And again, we're using our own um, data to show this to you. I've got an email address, first name, last name, which I've blacked out because some of you will recognize your names here. We've got phone numbers, the city, state, zip, country, title, your IP address, create date, the date last modified, the, what you expressed interest in, the department you're in, the company you're from. Again, we blacked that out. The number of followers you have, the number of Twitter clicks, Facebook clicks, LinkedIn clicks, connections that, are, that you have, clout score, whether or not emails were delivered, opened, clicked, the number of page views, visits, time last seen, original source, average page views. You can see that there's an awful lot of information that you can get out of um, social media clicks. I'm going to show you that in our application as well. Um, from here, what happens is we've got our Blue Sky Integration Studio. And I'm going to show you this first because this, again, is the heart of the application. And without getting into too much technical detail, I'm going to show you a couple of key you know, a couple of jobs that we have. We've got main sequences that integrate the data. We've also got specialized data integration uh, jobs that are written. In this case, we're showing an example of where we've integrated POS data with IRI uh, regional uh, RMA information. In this case, we're showing an example of where, of where we've integrated retail link data with some Nielsen uh, TD links information. We're also integrating it with some internal data sources. We're running it through our cleansing and validation processes. We're uploading that into the, to the database, which would have the clean data. We're identifying re, uh, data that does not apply to the business rules or meet the business rules required to load the database. And we're also removing duplicate data. 
In addition to that, we're sending an email notification based on the success or failure of that data load to whoever the individual is that's managing the application. We can manage that application for you if it's behind your firewall, or you can manage it yourself. If it's in our hosted data center, obviously we're managing that, but it's a very flexible architecture that allows us to do that. If I go in here real quick, and again, without getting into too much detail, I just want to show you some examples because within here we have, and this is the part of our application that we actually allow end users who want to control the application on their own behind their firewall, we let them use this because in our opinion, you have to be able to manage the application and be able to use it the way you want without having to call us. We're happy to take those calls. We're happy to, you know, perform consulting services, but we won't, don't want to dictate that you have to do that. So we provide instruction on how to use this data integration engine, and we have different jobs that we've already designed and written to handle things like IRI data, for instance, Nielsen data, master data, promotional information, uh, SAP data. There's all sorts of different uses and jobs that we've already have pre-designed. In addition, we've got the ability to integrate virtually any data source, ODBC, OADB, SQL Server, MySQL. Um, these are just some examples, Access, Excel, EDI data. We've got an EDI translator built right in. We also have jobs specifically that support Natiza, Teradata, DB2, SAP, and other data sources as well, including a direct object uh, that, will, that will bypass all the pop-ups you get with Walmart's retail link right in here. So we have that ability within our data integration engine. Now I'm going to show you what the, what the data looks like for the end users. So from here, I go into my Blue Sky Analytics. Again, this could be business objects or Cognos or MicroStrategy or Brio or whatever your preference is on a business intelligence tool. We always set up the project if it's in our data center using our tool, obviously, or else you have to uh, license another copy for our data center. Um, so on the home page here, I've got our different favorite reports. I've got some couple of category management reports in here. I've got some marketing reports. I've got sales management reports. And I can click on any one of those, and they will open, and I'll see this rep by region report open up at the end over here. But as you can see, I also have other reports opened as well. So if you look across the top, I've got my start page, I've got my social media clicks, I've got my Twitter sentiment, POS workbook, ship to consumption, Walmart zero scans, and I'll show you some examples of each of those. But we're going to focus on the social media reports today. The social media clicks. This is where I had explained to you that we're actually using uh, some of our own data to understand what, um, what our customers are most interested in. Are they interested in understanding the omni-channel or big data or trade promotion management? These are uh, some examples of the data that we pulled. But if I go I, across the bottom here, I can see here are the emails that were opened based on the email campaign. And there's a grand total and then based on emails sent out. Here are my social media clicks. Here's referrals. This one shows my page views by state, percent visits by campaign, and I'm going to go into this in a little more detail. But if I go back to the first view, I can see, again, this is just a view. If I click up here and show all my headers, I see I've got a lot of information here. I've got their email, their first name, their state, their phone number. I'm not going to pull some of these into the report for the purpose of protecting those individuals that have uh, expressed interest, but I do want to show you that this is the type of information that's available. I can look at, um, you know, what department they're in. Maybe I just want to see people by the, you know, any IT people that had expressed interest. I can see that their main under information that they've requested is on big data and trade promotion management. Just to understand, this is just related to the last um, three email uh, marketing campaigns that we sent out. I can also click on, um, you know, additional information and I can filter on anything. I've got last name and their cloud score. Again, if I click on the, if I click on this, I can set this up so that we're not, you know, viewing all of their contact information. I'll click that back up. Um, I can show you the cloud score and then I think I've got an example here, but I can pull into this report, any information 
uh, that I want. I'm looking just at average page views. I can pull in their number of followers by their last name. And again, for the purpose of privacy, I'm not going to show that to you. But I have set up these views here so you can see. Um, this one is, it does show their last name, but I've shrunk the field up so that you can't actually see anybody's first name here. But I can see what their cloud score is. I can also see how many followers they have. And if I want, I can pull that right into this section here that shows the number of followers. I can show the number of conversions, meaning after they've clicked on one page, how many times did they click on another page? So anything with more than a, more than a one means that they've clicked on at least, uh, they've clicked on more than just the advertised page. So they actually went farther into our, um, our website. And I can actually look at the number of page views too. So all of that's available just by pulling that information in. I can also kind of swap it out if I wanted to and look at number of page views and, you know, however I want to look at that, I can, I can pull that information into or out of the report. Um, I can also pull in the company, but again, I'm not going to do that because I don't want company, others to see the companies that are participating in the webinar here today. Um, I can look at it by state. Now, this is interesting because based on the way people fill in their registration forms, certain things can happen. We can, we can clean up these uh, and get rid of Ghana as a state, for example, through our, our uh, business intelligence tool. But what's pretty interesting here is I can take this, and right now I'm looking at, you know, my top five. Maybe I want to look at others. I, went, I want to maybe look at, um, I want to look at this in a bar chart. And maybe instead, I've got to sort here. I'm going to go up here, and I'm going to show my headers. I've got to sort based on state here of the number of visits. So in California and in Illinois, I get the highest number of visits. If I click on this again, I can resort it and see where I have my lowest number of sorts, or lowest number of um, uh, searches here, or lowest number of visits. I'm sorry, it's right here. Then I can also see the percent visits by campaign that I mentioned to you before. So we've had three uh, email campaigns go out recently, one on big data for CPG, one on the big data white paper, and one on learning how to handle big data. And we can see the uh, number of visits just via emails sent. This is just, a visit, just via the emails that were sent based on a single list that we have. Uh, the number is actually much greater when we incorporate and add in all the other data sources. So with that, I'm now going to show you the Twitter sentiment. Twitter sentiment, this is an extract, a different extract, but again, here I'm looking at my total comments. So if I wanted to look at just my positive comments versus negative comments, I can see that I've got 97% of um, these are positive. Oh, actually, I'm looking at this by male and female. I could also look at this by female, negative, neutral, and positive sentiment, and that wouldn't make sense necessarily in um, a pie chart, but I could look at it in a bar chart like that. I can do the same thing with my male sentiment. So you can see females have a much higher positive sentiment. Males have a much higher negative sentiment. I can look at it like that. I can also look at positive by gender and just chart that, negative by gender. So I've got some standard reports I look at all the time, negative comments by state. And I can see that my negative comments in Wisconsin and in Tennessee are pretty darn high. So maybe I want to find out what's going on in those areas. I can also go up here and show all my headers. Oh, and I'm sorry. I wasn't scrolled up all the way, actually. My negative comments and... LA, Texas, Illinois, Indiana, those are all much higher. So I had them all charted. Um, I was just scrolled down here when you saw those other ones. So I'm going to scroll back up. And I'm looking at my negative sentiment, lowest to highest, if I want to change that and look at my negative, you know, neutral and positive sentiment. I can do that. I can look at my grand total. I can remove the sort on my negative sentiment. And maybe I want to sort, and I can also put in multiple sorts, but I'm sorting state by this column. 
So now I'm looking at my grand total of sentiment overall and uh, of my comments. People that comment on this particular product are in Indiana, Ohio, and LA the most often. So my highest number of comments come from those states. And if I wanted to um, look at some additional detail, I can say, you know, I want to see the snippet of information. Actually, I'll, I'll continue by showing you um, the pre-designed reports I already have. So we already just showed you the negative comments. Oh, this is negative comments by city. So we pulled in city information here. So I've got my top 10 positive states, most frequently used negative words. And again, if I go up here and I show all my headers, I can see the information that I've pulled into this report. The words dislike, boring, it's not good. These are all the most common negative words. I can also pull another information and do the same thing with that. And I can highlight those as well. So I can see that there are some positive words if I add in all of the different positive to the general. Uh, information. Now, if I wanted to, I could align this information also with sales data. Um, this is an example. Now, I'm not aligning the social media data in with this, but you can understand how if you're looking at daily information, you can also be looking at versus your uh, daily sales. This is an example of where I'm looking at sales across different retailers. If I wanted to go in here and highlight whatever I want, I can actually compare uh, this different product with this different product across retailers. And maybe I want to go in and put this in a PowerPoint slide. I can just grab it and pull it into this area that says Create PowerPoint, and I can take the chart, the grid, or both. I'll take both. I can also go into my product-specific reports like I have here, and I can just grab it and pull it into Create PowerPoint. I can go through any one of these reports that I already have pre-designed. I can even go back into, say, my social media reports, and I can pull that information in there as well. I can also go onto my ship to consumption, for example. This, this report is showing my shipments versus my actual sales, and I can chart that. In this case, there's some information hidden behind each other, so I can go in and I can change my chart transparency. I also see that there's a note here for me, and I can grab that and pull that into PowerPoint. Um, so a user can create the report and they can add notes they can also go in and create um, calculated fields. In this case, I do have a calculated field, inventory change. If I wanted to edit that or create a new one, you can see that there are all sorts of different functions built right in for the um, business users to be able to leverage. In addition to that, the um, users can create exception highlights. And I believe I've got an example of exception highlights in this report. Oh, well, in the different views, I can just show you what it looks like. I can go in. Here's my exception highlights. I can create a new one, and I can give it a name. I can choose the color. I can give it a um, condition when sales or units is between a certain number and so forth, and I've got all the different ways that I can shade the text or the background or the cell or what have you. I also have the ability to um, export the data, and I can export any report or information into Excel, text, PDF, HTML, or XML. If, for example, I wanted to export this data into, a, um, into Excel, all of it, I could just use this acceleration button. So there may be some information in the report that I want to export into Excel, but I don't want to have to go through every single report view to do it. That's when I would use this acceleration button. So I can click on this. But first, before I do that, I'm going to click on this Create PowerPoint so, you, so I can wrap that portion of it up and show you that by simply giving it a name, I can click on that, ask if I'd like to open it, I'll say yes. That file then is opened, and the first page is blank intentionally so you can apply your masters and so forth and your titles. And all those charts and reports that I had are now available in PowerPoint, including the notes. Now, inevitably, people will ask, is that real data? No, the answer is those are just JPEGs. However, we do have a way of 
getting the real data in there and getting that automated to be updated, and then I'll show you that here. What we do in those cases, um, so with the acceleration button here, and before I jump into that, I'm going to first show you the query builder because we have a shared metadata that can be accessed through our Blue Sky Analytics or through our, the Excel um, uh, plugin that we have. And through the Excel plugin, you'll see this exact same metadata layer that you see in our Blue Sky Analytics. So if, for example, I go into my um, Blue Sky world and say I show you my POS Mart item world, I click on that, you'll see the facts here. There's a limited set of facts. I've got my um, item ID, retailer ID, on-hand dollars, units, on-order dollars, units, sold dollars, units, and the sell price. I also have certain time dimensions in here. I've got product information, including ID, item number, UPC, and so forth. I've got retailer information, and I've got retailer item. And that includes item group, description, UPC, packing type, category, brand, class, subclass, case, inner and outer pack. Now, just for example, I'm going to show you another world. Worlds are subsets of information from within the POS Mark database that supports different user requirements with multiple levels of security. So you may be part of the replenishment team, and in this case, you may have access to different information. Your POS metrics will be consistent, but you may have additional information um, than the others had. In this case, we've got bucketing going on here. Uh, we've got week-to-date, month-to-date, quarter-to-date, year-to-date information as well. We also have forecast information in here. And we've got replenishment information. We've got information on whether the product is traded or valid, the days with no sales, the days with no inventory, on-hand units, on-order dollars, in-transit dollars, in-transit units, and so forth. So a much greater, uh, a much more vast amount of information than you saw in that previous world. You don't necessarily need your sales teams knowing all of this information, but the forecasting and replenishment team do. We've got item information that includes everything from the UPC item and item number to the effective date, obsolete date. You see all the different things in here. The department, the subclass, fine line information, max order quantity, and so forth. Lead time. We've got store information that, again, is much more vast than you saw in the last world. We've got the name, the store number, the store name, um, the actual address, and so forth. A lot additional information in here size class, subdivision, square footage, store demographic information. This is where we've integrated it now with some third-party data from Nielsen. Um, I believe this is Nielsen data where we've um, been able to align it with the demographic information, including age, nationality, education level, and store traits that, again, are coming from, um, in this case, I believe it's Spectra. So these are just some examples of how we could go in and create new reports based on the data that we've integrated. If I click on this acceleration, excuse me, the acceleration button, I can give this a name, and I can, I'm going to put this on my desktop, and I'm going to export all reports from all open workbooks, and you can see it's actually going through the different workbooks and exporting that information. And it looks like the super consumption one is that had the one that had the exception highlights. And again, everything that we've charted above is dynamically, uh, or anything we've highlighted above is dynamically charted below. So it's complete. So it's exported now all those different workbooks. Here's the POS workbook with the retailer share information, CSV clean data, target uh, information, and so forth. All of that is available here as I scroll through my reports. So you can see that all that data is now in um, Excel. And if I go up here, I can see that I've got in Excel, I've got a button that says Blue Sky. So from this button, I can go in and I can view my log, refresh the query. I can create a new query. Let's say I do that. So from within the Create Query button, I go in and Again, there's, multi there's security built in, so I log in with my username and password.
and it's going to give me access now to the same levels of information that I had before. You'll see I have that same replenishment world that I just got done showing to you within Blue Sky Analytics, except now I can create that report right here in Excel. Any reports and charts that I create using my Excel plugin can then be tied to PowerPoint using the Microsoft features. And within those Microsoft features, any reports that, or, or uh, dashboards that you create can then be refreshed with a single click on this button. It will refresh those reports. And if you have those reports tied to PowerPoint, you'll also be able to refresh your PowerPoint information. And again, here's that um, store information with square footage information, the store demographics. You'll see I have access to that exact same world that I had access to before. Same with store traits. And if I go back over here and I scroll down to my POS Smart Item World, again, I can see those same POS facts and the same time dimensions, products, retailers, and so forth. So now imagine that we take this data and we align our sales information. In this case, I'm showing examples of where we've got Walmart zero scan right down to the store item. If we were to leverage the big data that's coming in from social media with, say, the Twitter sentiment, we could align what's going on at the store level right down to the zip code. So we may see information occurring at the zip code on specific items or just related to specific stores based on Twitter sentiment. So I don't actually have that integrated right within this. I'm just trying to give you some ideas on how we could do that. So you can see that we can align zip codes with specific states or the zip codes with the specific zip code information if that's provided. And then we can start to then make sense out of what's going on. Because a store sale is affected not only by the price availability and brand name and things like that, but based on promotions and what sort of offers you're making, but maybe actually on an event. Maybe there was a hurricane nearby. Maybe there was a hurricane that hit your city and that affected the sales. Maybe you're thinking that there's an issue with store number 102 and there really isn't an issue that is controllable. Maybe there is an issue that's controllable. Maybe there's a picket going on. Uh, maybe there's some, some union members picketing Walmart stores in a specific city for some reason. That could, be, that could affect sales as well. Maybe there's some influence you have over those things and maybe not. But the key is at least knowing where those issues are occurring and what might be affecting them. So being able to align that, the more information that you have, the more data that's available to you, the more you're going to know about your business. If we can integrate it with promotional information, that's great. If we can integrate it with pricing information, great. If we can information with, integrate it with weather trend information, we've done that. But now... Social media data is readily available. Everybody should be starting to do it if they're not doing it yet, but that's where, we're, that's where we're starting to see people just kind of starting to understand. Because in the past, having an application that would just uh, tell you what your sales are and you know, where you are out of stock and so forth was enough. But as we learn more about our business, we want to learn even more about our business. So as new data becomes available, you need to have that enterprise foundation that will allow that to happen. So with that, um, I'm going to turn this back over to Karen, and let's see, I've got our, our goal slide here, and I hope you think the goals for today were accomplished. Um, oh, I lost my goals page here. Let me scroll back through that. I'm not sure how that happened. Um, I hope you think those were accomplished. Uh, we went over examples of, of raw social media data feeds. I explained how those are integrated and also provided you with some examples that showed how big data could be leveraged to give you greater insights into your customers. Uh, keep in mind the insights, the, the insights only get greater when you integrate them with sales and other relevant data. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Karen, who's going to let, tell you how to get a copy of this presentation and how you can schedule a meeting uh, with our company if this is relevant for you. Thanks, Janet. That was a great informational webinar. I think we all learned a lot and the goals were definitely accomplished. If you're interested in having a consulting session with Janet to discuss and brainstorm on how your company can leverage social media data, or if you're interested in scheduling a one-on-one -on -one demo related to your business, 
please contact me at our company phone number. I'm extension 232. The recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel, and you can find it by searching Relational Solutions on YouTube. You can also download our white papers, follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or simply give us a call. Thank you all again for joining us today for this informational webinar. We hope you found the demonstration helpful. Please send us comments on how you liked the webinar and how we can uh, improve upon it for the future. We will follow up with questions that were submitted and related answers. We thank you again and hope you have a great day.